Have you ever watched young children at play, whether they're playing games or sports, and when one of them messes up or makes a bad play or makes a bad move on a game board, what's the first thing they do? Immediately they claim, overs! In fact, I've played golf with some, I shouldn't say just young men, young kids do that. I've played golf with adults that like to call, claim a lot of overs. They're called mulligans. But you know what? We're all God's children. And unfortunately, we all mess up from time to time. And that's why we need overs. Or I'm going to call it t today a fresh start. In this communion service today, I want each of you to realize that each of us has an opportunity here today to walk away from here, ask for, and receive that fresh start from our Heavenly Father. You can walk away from here, you know, and when you do that, when you ask Father for, upon repentance, I mean true from the heart repentance, and you ask Him for that forgiveness, it's His pleasure. He takes the book that has your name in it and all the mess ups and he just erases those and so I encourage each of you to take that opportunity today we also have another opportunity this morning you know we have the opportunity to ask for and receive a healing this morning whether that be a spiritual healing or a physical healing you can ask for it and receive it with the stripes that Jesus Christ took for you and me, we received the healing. And I encourage you to consider that this morning. We're going to look at a couple of examples today of people who needed, asked for, and received a fresh start. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. And we're going to, something's going to become readily apparent as we look at these examples we're going to see that these people have two things in common. Consider that when you ask for and expect to receive a blessing or forgiveness or a healing. Consider these two things. And I'm not going to tell you what they are until we get there. So let's go to Mark chapter 5. And we're going to pick it up with verse 21. Mark 5:21. we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, and it reads, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Boy, you know, when miracles are being performed, word gets around fast. When the truth is being taught, word gets around fast. And all these people are waiting for him, for an opportunity to hear this teaching, to have the opportunity for a fresh start. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, the church, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now what does that indicate about Jairus? Well, number one, Jairus is humble, isn't he? Do you think he believes that Jesus is the Lord? Yeah, that proves to me that he believed and he's worshiping him at his feet. He's got something he's going to ask for. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed and she shall live. Okay, something else about Jairus we just learned there. Do you think he's got faith? Indicates to me that he's got faith. He believes that if Jesus would come and but lay his hands on his daughter, she would live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. I mean, we've got a mass of people following after Jesus. And while this group, a large group, is moving to Jairus' house... Verse 24, and Jesus went with him, we got that, I'm totally sorry, and while they were on the way, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Now, how many tribes are there in Israel? 12. I think what we're going to learn here and what Jesus would have us learn is that at this time, 
Israel is sick. The priesthood of Israel is sick. 25. And we got that one, I'm sorry. 26. And had suffered many things. In other words, she tried all kinds of medical treatments of many physicians and had spent all that she had. Every penny she had, she spent with the doctors. Boy, you can do that easily today, I'll tell you. But rather, and nothing, and nothing bettered. In other words, nothing helped, but rather grew worse. No one could help her. Well, there was one that could help her, and she's going to prove her faith and her belief that Christ can give her a new start, a fresh start. Verse 27. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press, or the crowd, behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She had faith. She believes that if she but touched the garment of Christ, that she would be made whole. After treatment, after treatment, after treatment, after spending her, her nest egg on medical treatments, she believed that if she could but touch his garment, she would be made whole. You know what? We have that opportunity to touch his garment today when we all take of his table. And straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. She knew that a divine power had touched her and she knew that she had been healed. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. In other words, he felt the power going out of his body and into her body to accomplish the healing. Turned him about in the press or the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? That's a little bit uh, indignant, I think, on the part of the disciples. They're basically saying, look at all these people, and you expect us to tell you who touched your garment? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. He knew who it was, obviously. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, knew she had been healed. She knew she had a fresh start came and fell down before him and told him all the truth, worshiping him, thanking him. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Healed through her belief on Jesus and faith that if she but touched his garment, she would be made whole. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue, this is Jairus, we already covered, from his house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Why trouble the teacher any further? The daughter's already dead. He, he can't do anything for her. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only believe. I encourage you to etch what Jesus just said in your mind. Believe when you ask for that fresh start. Have the faith that he can do it if it's in his will. And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. These are the same three that Jesus took with him in Matthew chapter 17 to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Hang on to the numbers. How many of his disciples went? Three. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them which wept and wailed greatly. They're, I mean, grieving and mourning. It's, it's a terrible situation. His daughter is dead. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. 
she's about to receive a fresh start. In fact is, if I can say it without sounding irreverent, that's more like a jump start. Is, is Christ capable of doing that? You bet he is. What did he do with Lazarus? How long was Lazarus in the, in the sepulcher? Four days. He, he had begun to stink. And Christ called him forth and he came forth. And they laughed him to scorn. Uh-oh. Does that sound like belief? No, that sounds to me like unbelief. He's going to get rid of the unbelievers. Something else that we can learn. Get rid of the dead wood. But when he had put them all out, not only did he speak with authority, he acted with authority. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, this is the three disciples, and entered in where the damsel was lying. You know, we got three disciples, we got the mother, and we got the father. What's five in biblical numerics? Grace, you're exactly right. And this girl is about to receive the grace of our Heavenly Father. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Now, did the girl's parents have faith and believe? They did. And their daughter received a fresh start as a result of that. And I want you to learn something from that too. Intercessory prayer for those who are in need of a fresh start works. This girl didn't do anything, did she? she, she they thought she was dead. So she didn't have any proof of belief. Maybe she did. We're not told so. Maybe she had faith. We're not told so. But the parents did. That's the point I'm making. So as you partake of communion today, if you know someone who is ill in your family, and I'm speaking spiritually or physically, ask for that healing and give them a fresh start as well. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of 12 years. Here we go with that 12 again, the tribes of Israel. By the way, and let me finish this and then we'll go back. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. I mean, never before had a man, who they thought Christ was, brought somebody back from the dead. They were astonished by it. By the way, Talitha Kumi in verse 41, you know what language that is? Aramaic, the language of the captivity. I think Christ also saying, believe on me and don't be part of the captivity. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. You don't tell the, to his disciples and the mother and father. He said, you don't tell anybody about this. And commanded that something should be given her to eat. You think he said, give her some milk? No, I'm sure he said, give her some meat. Some meat of the word that sustains us all and frees you from the captivity. Let's look at one other example of someone who asked for and received a fresh start. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. So, what we learned in, when that, in Mark there, what are the two things that all those people had in common? Faith and belief, right? All right, keep that in mind. Luke chapter 5, let's go with verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day that he, this being Christ, was teaching. Boy, how would you like to set in on some of that teaching? Maybe someday. That there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. I mean, we got some script lawyers standing by actually they were sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee Judea and Jerusalem I mean they are getting their ducks in a row this guy we don't know who he thinks he is but he's hurting he's making us look bad he's healing people he's bringing people back from the dead 
He's hurting our pocketbook. Did you hear what he did in the temple in Jerusalem? Walked in and turned those money changers' tables over? Whose money do you think he thinks that was? That was ours, or part of it. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And I'll add, those who believed upon him. Verse 18. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. He's paralyzed. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. They wanted to bring him in to the house and lay him before Jesus. There's a big crowd there too though, verse 19. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, the crowds, again, word gets around fast when miracles are being performed. They went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. They couldn't get him in through the doors, so they climbed on top of the house, carried the man on his, his cot or stretcher, took the tiles off the ceiling, making a hole in it, and lowering him down to where he could be before Jesus. What does that indicate? They believed. They had the faith that if they could but get this one before Christ, he would be healed. He'd have a fresh start. Number 20. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now wait a minute. This guy is paralyzed. He has, he has a physical ailment, does he not? But Christ is saying, your sins are forgiven? Could it be that maybe our spiritual lives and our physical illnesses are somewhat tied together? Don't know. Interesting thought. But Christ didn't say immediately, Okay, your physical ailments are forgiven. Get up and walk. He said, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? In other words, only God, according to them, can forgive sin. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, these scripture lawyers and Pharisees, remember, they're looking for something to get Christ, to catch him, so that they can put him, in their minds, out of business. They haven't got what it takes to put Christ out of business. But they're, they're, at this point, they're going, aha, we got him now. He just blasphemed. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts, in your minds? What's the problem here? Note God can read your mind. Christ read their mind. Perceived means well knowing. In other words, he knew very well what they were thinking in their minds. Emmanuel, we were to name him God with us. He can read minds. Verse 23, Christ continues, Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. Now the reason, 24, But that, in other words, this is the reason, that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man, of course, being Christ in the flesh on earth. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thy house. Get up and walk. You've got a fresh start, a new beginning. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Important to when you receive a blessing, when you receive a healing, don't forget to thank our Heavenly Father. And that's what glorifying Him is. Also telling others what your Father did for you. So a witness to them so that they can be strengthened and edified by it. 
Verse 26, And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things this day. Strange meaning contrary to what's expected. In other words, extraordinary things have we seen this day. Well, was this something new that Christ would be able to heal and perform miracles? It had been written centuries before by the prophets. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. And you know the Pharisees and scripture lawyers should have been familiar with this scripture, wouldn't you think? Isaiah 53, verse 1. And we're going to have Isaiah and the remnant speaking in these scriptures, particularly the first one. Isaiah 53, 1. Who hath believed our report? And this report, check it out, can mean doctrine. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Well, the Pharisees... And the scripture lawyers sure hadn't heard that report, had they? Or they wouldn't have been so astonished and so surprised. Have you heard the report? I know you have. Verse 2. For he, now notice most of these verses have got a star after him. That means that these refer to Jesus Christ. And that's who we're talking about here. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, indicating the condition of the world at the time that he was born. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. He came as a babe in the swaddling clothes, and there, you know, as, a, as an infant, there really wasn't anything extraordinary about him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Even Peter, who was that one that was so bold on the night that Christ was betrayed that he took out his sword and he cut off the ear of one of those that came to take Christ away. Jesus said, no, Peter, don't do that. And he healed the man's ear. But even Peter, who was that bold, three times denied Christ, as Christ had told him he would. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs, and this is illness or sickness in grief, and carried our sorrows and our pain Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. As they mocked him on the cross and said, If you be the Son of God, save yourself. You've saved others. Come down off the cross and save yourself. Would he do that? No. He knew prophecy had to be fulfilled. This very prophecy we're reading now. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced with those nails of iron as they drove him through his feet and his hands. Was it for his sins and transgressions? No, it was for our sins and transgressions. Each time that hammer hit, driving that spike in his hand, how many thousands of our sins, do you think, were wiped away? Verse, and we'll we get to transgressions. He was bruised. This is a violent death, and it indeed was a violent death that he suffered. For our iniquities, again, not his, the chastisement of our peace or our well-being was upon him, and with his stripes 
we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And boy, at one point in our lives or another, we all go astray. We all fall short. We don't do things that we should do. But that's why we need overs. That's why we need a fresh start from time to time. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity, the sins of us all. And could he cut it? Yeah, he could cut it. You know why he could cut it? Because he loves you. He loves you very much, and he tolerated that for you. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, the Passover lamb to be exact. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from the prison and from judgment, from Pontius Pilate's Roman judgment. And who shall declare his generation? I tell you, we will declare his generation. For he was cut off. This means he was judged worthy of death. Was he worthy of death? No, he was completely innocent, without spot, as the Passover lamb. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked. We had those two male factors, one on each side, you remember? Crucified with Christ. And with the rich in his death. Joseph of Arimathea was a very wealthy man. And he purchased a sepulcher, a brand new one, that Jesus' body was placed in. Praise God, it didn't stay there, though. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Completely innocent, perfect. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Again, yours and mine. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And indeed, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Christ says, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am now alive, and forevermore I am alive. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, referring to Christ. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And indeed, he has justified many. Therefore will I divide him, this means to give him, a portion with the great, referring to Christ still, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. The spoil here, check out in Colossians 2.15, and we're talking about the uh, spoiled principalities. The principalities like the power and principalities. We don't fight against flesh and blood, Ephesians chapter 6, but powers and principalities. The principality that's going to be spoiled is Satan, I tell you. And his strong, who's going to help with the uh, bringing down of the principalities? His elect are the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That all sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? I mean, all we have to do is truly repent, repent and mean it from the heart. And he took all of those transgressions, all those sins that you and I have committed on himself. That, that's Pretty cheap, isn't it? No, no, it wasn't cheap. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. It was not cheap. Matthew 27, let's pick it up with verse 11. 
And Jesus stood before the governor. This is Pontius Pilate. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. This is a figure of speech, meaning you said that, I didn't. They were accusing him of being king of the Jews, meaning Judah. Was he the king of Judah? No, he was the king and he was and is the king of all of Israel. And when he was accused of the chief priest and the elders, he answered nothing. We saw that prophecy, did we not, in the scripture we just covered, written centuries before in the book of Isaiah. Not a whimper, not a word in his own defense. He knew he was innocent, but he also knew that he had to suffer on the cross for prophecy to be fulfilled, number one, and for God's plan of salvation to be carried out. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? You'd better defend yourself. Say something in your own defense. And he answered him never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. I mean, he had to probably admire Christ, that he would not say anything in his own defense. Now at that feast, the governor, this is Pilate again, was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. In other words, at the Passover, it was the custom for the Romans to try and make the Hebrews happy. We'll release one prisoner at Passover. And now you guys pick out who you want to be released. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Barabbas means son of the father. Jesus was also son of the father. Barabbas, now those of you who don't know, historically is accredited with murdering over 400 people. We're talking about a bad hombre here. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. He knew because of jealousy the scribes and the Pharisees and the heads of the church, the religious muckety ducks, had delivered Christ before Pilate. He's trying to make these people, what's wrong with you people? I'm giving you a choice of this innocent man or this guy who's murdered over 400 people. And you want the guy that murdered 400 people free to go and murder some more? When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife, this being Pilate's wife, sent unto him saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? He's innocent. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Set Barabbas free. Crucify Christ. And we're not talking about the Roman soldiers. We're talking about people that are high up in the church, the religious community. We've also got some Kenites in there. They want him dead. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain, which of the two, will you that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Christos in the Greek, the anointed one. They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, he wasn't making any headway with these people. But that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. 
Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. That's nothing new either. From the blood of righteous Abel, to the prophets, to Zacharias who was slain between the porch and the altar, the blood is on their hands. Christ said, you wicked and evil generation, you generation of vipers, you think this, you won't be called to account for this? Oh, there's a day of account coming, friends. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. With those stripes we are healed. Scourge, if you don't know, is to whip him. How many of you have witnessed the Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson? I mean, if you watch that and this doesn't touch your heart, uh, something wrong with you because it was a tremendous price he paid. I think Pilate here is, he's, he's verbally said everything he can think of trying to get these people to come to their senses. You got an innocent man here, you got Barabbas, He's not getting anywhere with them. I think by scourging Christ, he's trying to make them come to their senses. Maybe they'll change their mind and say, whoa, stop. They won't say, whoa, stop. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered him the whole band of soldiers, the Roman soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe purple, symbolic of royalty. They're getting ready to mock him. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, symbolic of a scepter of the king. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. It's written in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. God will not be mocked. For what a man sows, he will reap. Uh, those who did this to him will reap what they have coming. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Now, if you take a crown of thorns and put it around someone's head and then you take a stick and you hit the crown of thorns, what does that do? It drives the thorns into the head. So we see the blood of Christ start down his face. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man, Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And it's not written here, but in the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 28, eight, on the way up that hill, Golgotha, the women were weeping along the side of the road. And Jesus said, women of Jerusalem, weep not for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. Blessed are the barren, a message to God's election. Make sure you're among the barren and not spiritually with child when the false Messiah returns. And when they were coming to a place called Gogatha, that is to say, a place of the skull, very near, if not the same hill, Moriah. You remember God instructed Abraham to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. God was testing Abraham's faith. And that was also a type, because indeed, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his own son, but he provided a ram in the place of Isaac. God will sacrifice his own son and not provide a ram in his place. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. Gall is a product of poppy. When mixed with vinegar, it was like a poor man's wine, but it was also laced with drugs. And when he had tasted thereof, in other words, he tasted the drugs, he would not drink. <coughs> Prophecy of Psalm 69, 21 fulfilled. And they crucified him and parted his garments, 
casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, and the prophet here being David, Psalm 22, verse 18. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. I think this referring to the Roman soldiers. They, they sat down to see what was going to happen next with all these things. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Wrong. King of all of Israel. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. Both of the male factors, as it's written in one of the other Gospels. One of the male factors said to Christ, If you be the Son of God, come down off that cross and save yourself and us. The other male factor rebuked him, told him to stop, and he said to Christ, Lord, if, it, if it's possible, let me see you in thy kingdom. In other words, he expressed belief in Christ. Christ said, this day I will see you in paradise. And so it was. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. Wagging of the head is a, a gesture of mockery. And this, again, fulfilling part of Psalm 22, verse 7. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, speaking to Christ mockingly, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. That temple would be raised again in three days. We're talking about the body of Christ. That's what he meant when he told them, tear down this temple and in three days it will be rebuilt. He wasn't talking about the temple that had been built by the hands of man. Verse 41. Likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders said. We got the religious leaders here mocking him as well. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel... Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God, fulfilling more prophecy of Psalm 22, verse 8. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. But one did believe now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. We're talking from noon until 3 p.m. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatane. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, many, many Christians teach, supposed men and women of the cloth, teach that this means that Christ had a weak moment. He felt that he had been betrayed by his father. What was he doing? You all know. He was teaching the first verse of Psalm 22, written almost a thousand years before the words of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ saying, look to Psalm 22. It will tell you exactly what was going to happen. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. Greek for Elijah. He's calling for Elijah when they heard him say, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar. Written in one of the other Gospels, Christ said, I thirst and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. No gall this time. Verse 49, the rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Don't do anything else. I want to see if Elijah really will come. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the spirit. The price had been paid. The price for you and me to have a fresh start. Forgiveness of sins, a healing if that's what you need, a spiritual renewal if that's what you need. But it wasn't free. 
And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Anyone could now enter into that holy of holies, the residence of our heavenly Father. That veil which separated man from the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant was kept, which when he resided with man was his home. Nobody could go in there into the Holy of Holies, except the high priest, and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement, and then only with the blood of bulls and goats for his sins and the sins of the people. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared unto many. And this was a one-time thing to prove that Christ had indeed defeated death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The reason Christ came to the earth in the flesh was to destroy he who has the power of death, that is to say, the devil. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Death has no sting over us, beloved. The grave has no victory over us. Just as Christ arose, you will be resurrected also, unless he returns first. I hope that's soon, don't you? Now in the centurion, this is a Roman, and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. At this time, I'm going to ask the communion servers to come forward. And truly, that was the Son of God. So, as you partake of this communion today, do you need a fresh start? Do you need a new beginning? How about a healing? I mean, I'm talking spiritual or physical. Ask, believe, and have faith. You know, it's not this bread or this wine that can heal you. It's what they are symbolic of. The bread, symbolic of the body of Christ. The blood, symbolic of His blood. As you partake of this communion today, I want you to to really focus on something. I want you to focus on what Christ endured for us. Let us pray. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table before us today, Father. This table that you have set, Father, that we can partake of, Father. That when we need a renewal of spirit, Father, we can come away renewed. If we need that forgiveness, Father, we can ask for it this time. And upon repentance, receive it, Father. We can ask for a healing, whether spiritual or physical, Father. And know that with faith and belief in you, that it will be accomplished, Father. There are many of the congregation, Father, that can't be with us today, Father. We pray that they're with us spiritually at this time, Father. Always we ask that you continue to give wisdom to the leaders of our great nation, Father. And remember us all, Father, in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, 
Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, if you'll check it out in a Strong's Concordance by Hendrickson, uh, Hendrickson Publishing Company, which is the Strong's that we offer, uh, you'll find that that is the case. Orville in Washington, there were items that were put in the Ark of the Covenant. One, a golden pot that contained manna. Uh, two, Aaron's rod. Uh, three, the tables of the Ten Commandments. And you say, and four, the book of the law. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4 uh, won't bear that out. Um, the book of the law at one time or another may have been put in there, but the, the tables, the tablets, were the main thing that were to be kept in there. Anyway, your question. Now I know manna is bread, and bread symbolizes our daily scripture. And let me add to that the bread of life, Jesus Christ as well. What, does the rest of, what do the rest of the items symbolize? Well, the, the tablets, uh, in, or in fact, they're called, uh, the, the Ark itself is called the Ark of the Covenant. And the reason it's called the Ark of the Covenant is because of the tablets that are in there. The tablets are the covenant. Uh, Aaron's rod, it's actually called Aaron's rod, which budded. And in Numbers chapter 16, we had... Uh, Korah, who was Aaron and Moses' cousin, uh, challenging the, the right of Aaron to serve the priesthood for the people of Israel. Uh, God was very angry with him. The, the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed Korah. Then the very next chapter, we have number 17, and God instructed that each of the tribe of Israel's uh, bring a rod, in other words, a piece of almond tree, cut it off of the tree, and you put it in the tabernacle tonight, and whichever rod buds, meaning it, that's a miracle, uh, the one representing that tribe is the one God chose to be the priest, and Aaron's but rod was the one that budded, and that therefore put in the Ark of the Covenant ever as a reminder to the people of Israel that God chose Aaron and his descendants to serve in that priesthood role. Rowena in California, I enjoy your teachings very much. I am a lukewarm Christian at this time, but with your teaching of the true word of God, I will be good to go soon. Okay, Rowena, well, we're glad you're studying with us and you stay in his word every day and you will be good to go soon. And when I say good to go, I mean into the eternity, uh, having eternal life. Now to your question, what exactly does an elder of a church do? What is expected of them, etc.? Well, scripture that you can read about elders, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, let's start along about verse 17. 1 Peter also is good, chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, elders, the, the word originally means, you know, older, but that I don't want you to get off track. It does not necessarily mean someone that, who has years uh, of age on them. What it does indicate is someone who has years of experience under their belt and they are able uh, and knowledgeable to teach others. And that might surprise some. Well, I didn't think an elder was supposed to teach, but if you'll make a note of 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5 and 1 Peter chapter 5, you'll learn that part of the responsibility of elders is to teach. Cynthia in Missouri. My new neighbors who are originally from Sweden have made it clear that they don't believe in God. They think that we Americans are silly to do so, that we use God as a crutch, whereas they don't. One evening, the man uh, stated that he didn't want any help from God and that uh, he can do it all by himself. He further stated that he shouldn't we shouldn't try to convert him. I told my husband to watch and see if this guy's life didn't start to go awry. And now approximately two weeks later, bingo, God is dealing with him. He is very wealthy and now his wood chipper, trailer, tractor, Cadillac, and other equipment are all kaput all at once. I love watching my father at work. 
So no doubt God will answer my prayer to be used by him to lead them to uh, Christ. So now for my question, do you think it is best to wait for a direct question or wait for what feels like the right moment uh, to see that, that God is trying to get your attention, to let him see God is trying to get his attention? Based on your past experience, which is best? What are the right words? I know to let the Spirit lead us, but me and my husband surely don't want to let our father down. I'm grateful that he's using us. Okay. Well, it doesn't hurt uh, to plant a seed, Cynthia, but also be careful not to cast your pearls before swine. Uh, this guy doesn't believe that there's a God. Uh, I'll quote a, a psalm that we taught just recently, Psalm 53, 1. Uh, the fool hath said, there is no God. And anyone that believes there is no God is indeed a fool. Uh, is God going to use you to lead them to Christ? I hope so uh, for their sake. But again, uh, don't get involved with casting your pearls before swine. Uh, okay to plant a seed, but don't cast them before swine. And I am getting the out of time signal, so I'll wait on that question until the next time we meet. Seems like this hour just flies by. Uh, I tell you, this word of God is so very, very good. God's so good to us that he shares his word with us, that letter that he wrote to us. Uh, I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying that letter in depth. You know what? It makes our Father's Day when he sees you with your Bibles open, seeking knowledge of him and from him from the written word. Uh, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in our Father's word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.